Welcome to Adastra. Over the next week or so, I start to get used to my new life. I find that the days are easy to adjust to, and like Alex said, 19 hours in a day isn't all that bad. Though the sleeping period is a bit shorter than I'm used to, it's been easier now that I sleep on Amicus's bed. After I'd fallen asleep next to him, we decided there was enough room. The wolf set one of his many long pillows down between us as a courtesy to me, even if he did sometimes end up rolling over onto my end. He's been busy these past few days, and I think it's because of what happened between him and Cato. He doesn't suggest any more outings, and instead wakes up early to go to meditation before leaving for the city to do various campaigning stuff. Amicus doesn't explain exactly what that involves, and he doesn't bring me along. I ask why, considering I thought my main job was to accompany him to these things, but he just says he's not doing the stuff that involves me quite yet. Instead, my introduction to the people of Adastra is going to be during the first trial. He says the reveal will be a lot more impressive that way, and that rumours are already spreading about his new pet. That's another thing. My involvement in the trial. Apparently I'm to be his partner in the dance portion, something I have no clue how to do. I've been getting more and more worried about it, telling Amicus he actually needs to show me what I'm going to be doing, but he brushes me off, telling me it's no big deal. Apparently the dancing is rather easy, and the main objective is just to show me off. Since everyone already knows what Alex is, I should be rather impressive to the officials that will be judging us. Amicus is confident that we'll win that portion of the contest easily. Still, he promises me at least a few sessions of practice before the actual day of the competition. I realise now that that's only three days away, and despite Amicus's constant reassurances, I can feel the stress building. I can only trust him that the dance is actually easy and simply an opportunity to show me off. Meanwhile, half of my days tend to be empty of things to do. I'm left on my own to either hang around in Amicus's room, have conversations with Com about Adastra and its culture, or just try and busy myself with menial work. Sometimes I hang out with Alex, which I enjoy, but lately I wonder if the idea that we're technically going to be competing against each other is causing a bit of a rift between us. Still, I get a lot of time with him since Cassius is out just as much as Amicus, if not more. We go out into the gardens a few times, and other times we watch Adastra and TV together, sometimes even catch an Amicus or Cassius giving speeches to the seemingly endless crowds of wolves. The broadcasters seem to like tallying up numbers, and it's clear that Cassius always has an edge. Still, from what I've gathered, Amicus has had a bit of a surge and manages to at least do better than half Cassius's numbers. It's still a little worrying though, but from what I can tell, popularity doesn't factor into the trials. When I'm not with Alex, I try to avoid running into any of the, other, any of the others, which is actually pretty easy. Cato is almost always absent from the palace doing his own official business as acting emperor. Virginia hasn't bothered to talk to me after our first interaction, probably deeming me incapable of any sort of conversation. Neferu, on the other hand, is the one person I have difficulty avoiding. Unlike the others, he greets me when he sees me and occasionally sticks out his paw so that I have to kiss it. The only difference now is that after I do it, he says the same to me. I think I gave him the false impression that it's some sort of normal greeting for my people. He seems to enjoy it quite a bit, but only tries it when Amicus isn't around. As for Cassius, I don't see him for the entire week. Until today. I'm in the dining room watching the screens and zoning out. The wolves are pretty talented at making basically all of their films incredibly boring. It's probably something to do with the long-winded monologues and theatrical acting. Alex is gone today doing some type of ambassador work in the city while Amicus is out with Cato, training, though he's supposed to be back in the next hour to give me that dance practice he's promised. I'm nodding off and thinking about heading back to Amicus's room to take a quick nap when Cassius suddenly comes in. He stalks in with that particular stiff gait that he has, along with his usual sour expression. Even though it's been a while since I've seen him, I haven't forgotten that look of his. I jump and quickly sit up straight, looking at the ground. There's only a moment of silence before his reedy voice breaks it. Pet, come with me! And with that, he turns and stalks right back out of the room. I sit there, stunned for a moment. First of all, Amicus told Cassius never to give me commands. Does that mean I shouldn't listen to him? 
I know immediately that wouldn't be a very good idea and I jump off my bed to hurry out into the hall. The important thing is that Amicus isn't here right now. I know that Cassius is not someone I want to piss off. I still remember how quickly he suggested he hit me as a punishment. I'm just in time to see his white tail disappear around a corner and I jog after him, noting just how confident he is that I'll follow him without question. I don't think he's even looked back once. I realise that we're heading out into the gardens, toward the same tables and benches that Alex and I have eaten our lunches at a few times. That's when I see Virginia, Virginia and Nefru sitting down already, cups and plates already on the table. I realise then what it is Cassius summoned me for and I relax a bit. After serving breakfast so many times, I know exactly what's expected of me. When Virginia spots us, she waves at Cassius, but he only grumbles under his breath. Oh, why is he here? I see the wolf's tail lash around in irritation, for it settles as we get closer to the pair. Good morning, Virginia. And Neferu. Cassius' voice takes on a dismissive tone as he says the jackal's name, barely even nodding his head at him. I'll tap be with you, Cassius. How are you this day? Cassius's tail lashes again, but only once. Wonderful! Virginia, you didn't tell me we have a guest. Virginia raises a brow. I'm sorry, did you need a warning of some kind, Cassius? Cassius sits, leaning back in the chair as he keeps his gaze on Virginia. I simply like to be prepared. There's a moment of silence, and Neferu, still smiling, looks back and forth between the brother and sister. I'm sorry, am I causing an inconvenience? No, Neferu. Cassius is simply being his usual gloomy self. Cassius's paws, which are clasped on the table, tighten their grip on each other. Virginia doesn't seem to notice, though, and instead looks up at me. And you brought Tibor? Cassius doesn't even look at me. I'm borrowing him. My pet is doing diplomatic work in the city. Virginia rolls her eyes. Really, Cassius, you can't manage to serve yourself even once. If I am to be emperor, I need to act like one, and please leave our questioning me for another time. I don't want to be rude to our guest. Cassius smiles at Nefro, though it looks forced. Another moment of tense silence. I take it as an opportunity to do my work. Me serve now? I almost snicker at my own caveman speech. Yes, pet. I go about serving him, picking up slices of baked and seasoned bread off the platter before setting them on a smaller plate. I set this in front of Cassius. Then I pour some tea out of the heated pot into Cassius's cup, before finally stepping back, hands clasped together. Luckily, Cassius and Virginia act like I'm not there, carrying on their conversation. Only Nefru seems to be constantly aware of my presence, occasionally glancing at me. Are you enjoying your stay here, Neferu? Neferu snaps, snaps his gaze from me to Cassius. Oh yes, thank you much, though. We all, you've all been so hospitable to me. I thank you. Cassius, is wave, Cassius waves his paw. It's the Wolven way, Neferu. No thanks are needed. Another moment of silence stretches out before Virginia reaches for a plate. Can I get you some Panaman, Neferu? But Neferu suddenly stands up. Actually, I should be on my way. I can tell you intended to speak with your sister alone, Cassius. Uh, good day and good day to you, Tibor. I jump, but quickly duck my head in response. Nefru then wanders off into the gardens, pours behind his back as he disappears behind the bushes and flowers. Cassius looks after him, his ears lowered and the inside slightly red. He's rather blunt, isn't he? Virginia doesn't respond, and Cassius looks over to see that she's glaring at him. What? He is our guest, Cassius. Start treating him like one. What I... <laughs> Cassius sighs and looks away, pouting. Virginia takes a sip of her tea before leaning back in her chair, letting the silence drag on a bit before finally speaking. What is it, Cassius? What is what? Why are you sulking more than the usual? Cassius sighs. I am very busy, Virginia, and I freed up this portion of my day to have good conversation. I've barely spoken to you since you returned, and I wanted to ask about your trip. Cassius takes a brisk sip from his cup. It's difficult to speak intimately when others are around, especially those of a different species. 
Cassius, if you wanted to speak alone, you only had to ask. I've simply worried that Nefru is growing bored of the palace, so I invited him along. Virginia grins. And you don't have to play emperor around me. I'm your sister. Lean back and relax a little bit. Cassius sighs again, but doesn't lean back. I must play the role I intend to fit, even when the situation does not call for it. You think father was always like that? I don't know. He did not speak to me much. Well, he wasn't. You can relax around me, Cassius. Cassius sighs and eats one of the crackers, leaning back into his chair very slightly. So how was Lux? Oh, you know, riots and crime complaints about a lack of funding. Well, there is a lack of funding. There is a lack of funds, certainly, but not from us. You know the officials there are corrupt and take most of it. That isn't the people's fault. No, but they should choose their politicians more carefully. They're electing officials based on how outrageous they can be. How does that result in sound government? The people are frustrated and the sentiment is spreading throughout the Empire. I've been telling you this for years. Certainly, we all know this. The question is how to fix it. By getting rid of the triumvirates that the people elect. If we rule directly, the Empire will become as sound as the palace we govern from. Mm -hmm. And you expect to do that easily? I expect it to be very, very difficult. And it's something I intend to do very, very carefully. The people need direction. And electing chaotic triumvirates is their cry for help. Virginia doesn't say anything. Instead, taking a very dainty sip of tea from her cup. Cassius clears his throat and sits up straight again. Anyway, why did you decide to bring this Chemian back with you? You never explained it clearly in your letters. But I did. His accommodations in Lux were rather poor. Bringing him pure and acquainting him with the Imperial family seemed like the natural decision to me. You know he's the Pharaoh's second son. Yes, but why was he in Lux and why didn't I know about it? Virginia shrugs. You can't expect to know about every diplomatic visit there is. Anyway, he was touring his siblings and was in Lux when the depletion happened. My question is why wouldn't the Pharaoh send a ship immediately to retrieve his own son? Well, Alex makes sense being your typical diplomat, but the son of a Pharaoh? He chose to stay. Cassius snorts. And why would he do that? Virginia stares at Cassius for a moment, a frown on her face. Cassius, you know the reason as well as I do. Despite the absolute chaotic, bankrupt, parentless mess our empire is in, the Chemians are willing to ally with us. He's trying to help establish that. They are taking advantage of us when we're at our weakest, Virginia. You know how I feel about this and that I have no plans for an alliance. I'm planning for all scenarios, Cassius. And as of now, you aren't guaranteed the Emperorship. Cassius doesn't say anything, stare into his empty plate. Slowly, I walk up to the table and refill the plate. My other wolves look at me. We should be grateful the Chemians even want to speak to us. None of the other siblings wants to be associated with a race that seems to have been abandoned. We don't know that yet. Well, they aren't speaking to us, are they? And they left us starbound. It is permanent we may never be able to travel beyond the star system again. That catches my attention. Didn't Namikus tell me that when he became Emperor, he'd be able to take me back? They're acting like they won't have to stretch dry forever. Cassius laughs. Once we are a new emperor, they will give us guidance again. They stopped immediately after father's death. What other explanation could there be? They didn't after grandfather's death. Cassius waves his paw in the air. Because father was in line for the throne without any challenge. The emperorship has not been in limbo like this in living memory. They are simply waiting for the empire to have firm leadership again before re-establishing contact. Cassius snatches a cracker off the plate I just refilled. It has happened before, even if that was before Drusus. But even if we're not able to, I have no doubt that I can still lead his empire to prosperity. And how would we do that without the stretch? We'd not be able to communicate with our children anymore. If the Chemians learn the stretch, then so can we. As for our children, abandon them. They've only been a burden anyway. Cassius glances at me and I quickly look down at the ground. Virginia sighs loudly. Sometimes the things you say frighten me, Cassius. Well, you know it'd be less so if you're on my side, Virginia. I'm on no one's side, Cassius. It's my duty to serve the Emperor, no matter who that might be. 
You're on Amicus's side. It's clear as Vita. Preference does not matter in the end. I don't like Cato, yet I serve him. Cassius, his ears flatten, he looks around. Lower your voice when you say such things, Virginia. And are you saying you dislike me like you do Cato? Well, of course not. But like I said, your ideas are extreme. Radical ideas are needed for times like these. It's how I've gotten so far with the people. Well, just remember that you and Amicus are both my brothers, and I love you equally. Just be civil when a decision is made. Cassius! We all jump as Amicus's voice seems to rattle the ivy on the pillars. Cassius settles back in his seat, rolling his eyes. What, Amicus? What the hell are you doing with my pet? Com says you have him. He wanted to serve me. How could I deny him? Do not lie to me, Cassius. I told you never to talk to him. Are you going to yell at me or tell me where you are so I can send him back? Where are you? I'm going to come out there. Cassius does look a little worried then. Come, where is Amicus? The main hall, Cassius. I'm coming out. Pet, go back inside and do not tell him where we are. Cassius shoes me away while Virginia just chuckles behind a paw. I make my way back inside, though Amicus meets me right at the entrance. He glares. What the hell does he think he's doing? What did he make you do? Amicus sets a paw on my shoulder, looking me over. Well, not much. I just served him while he talked to Virginia. Unbelievable. Amicus makes as if to walk out into the gardens. Where are you going? Going to give Cass a piece of my mind. I specifically told him not to... I set a hand on his arm, stopping him. Hey, it's fine. Is it? Because last I remember, he threatened to hit you. He didn't touch me at all. He ignored me the whole time. Amicus looks out into the gardens, still clearly wanting to go out there. Listen, I just want to get this dance practice done. I've been worried about it all week. Amicus pauses, then sighs, turning him back to walk into the palace. Fine. When I let Cassius get away with things like this, he tends to push it even further the next time. We walk in silence for a bit, our footsteps echoing like they always do in the marble halls. Are you alright? Well, I'm fine. Why? Well, you seem a little grumpy. Oh, it's just a long day in the city. Unlike Cassius, speeches don't come naturally to me. Something I just need to get used to. I walk alongside the wolf, feeling his furry arm brush up against mine. So, when do I get to go to the city? The wolf t tilts his muzzle down at me in surprise. Oh, you want to go? Well, yeah. Didn't you say I could? It's kind of getting boring here. Well, I'd say once the first trial is done. You'd be introduced to the public by then, so everyone will know who you are when we go. Can I plan on that, then? Well, of course. Well, I'm just surprised you want to see the city so badly. Well, looking at it from the balcony all the time has me curious. <laughs> well, visually it's not all that impressive. There are cities out there with larger structures and attractions. Adastra is mostly a city for imperial officers and their families. Still, we could find some entertainment, I'm sure. Well, as long as it isn't like the films I've seen on your TV. Well, it would be live entertainment, but it would be somewhat similar. Actually, if you don't like that, then you may not like the dance I'm about to show you. I realise then that we're walking in a new direction in the palace, down a hall I haven't been through since Alex gave me the palace tour. Where are we going? A well, throne room. Well, it should be empty right now. It's where we'll be performing. I feel myself getting a little nervous as we approach a large set of double doors. Amicus presses his paw to the black panel and they slide open. Inside I'm greeted by the largest room in the palace that I've seen yet. I look up the glistening walls, craning my neck to see the ceiling arch dozens of metres above us. Afternoon light filters through the windows, lighting up the place in a warm orange glow. Wow. You like it? Yeah. I look at the throne, framed by pillars and crystals that appear to be levitating. The crystals look similar to other structures in the palace that are used mainly for a light source. It's just that these ones are a lot bigger. Amicus walks into the centre of the room, our footsteps sounding much more cavernous here. We actually don't use it very often, it's more for tradition. So you won't sit on the throne all day yelling at people? Sadly, no. I can only remember a handful of times that father sat in it. 
I look around a bit, spinning in a slow circle. When I see Amicus again, he's quiet. His arms are folded as he stares at the throne. The look on his face tells me he's deep in thought. I give him a moment, but when the silence goes on for almost a minute, I finally clear my throat. Um, so did you want to show me the dance? Oh, right. Amicus walks towards me until he's standing just a few feet away. He sighs, then frowns, his ears down. What? Um, I wait, but he doesn't say anything. What? I say it a little more loudly, feeling nervous. Well, seriously, you're stressing me out. All right, listen. The role you'll be playing might seem a bit strange to you. Role? What do you mean by that? Amicus takes a deep breath, as if only now realising what a practice session is going to involve. Well, the dance we'll be doing is titled Mira, and it will involve things that you might find objectionable. Objectionable? All right, uh, let me try to explain this correctly. Basically, we'll be playing the roles of Drusus and Mira, an emperor and his lover. Wait, so this is like a play or a musical? I'm playing a character? Well, of course, it's a dance. Well, I guess, but you never told me that'd also be acting. Well, isn't acting part of dancing? What's the point of dance if you're not telling a story? I cover my face with my hands, rubbing it in frustration. Listen, quit saying these things to me like I should just know it. We're from different worlds. Of course things aren't the same on Earth. Ah, oh, yes, you're right. Uh, I'm sorry. I just... You're so much like a wolf that I forget. It's fine. What is it that I'd find objectionable? I remember his description of the dance included the word lover. Wait, what sort of things am I going to have to do with you? Look on Amicus's face worries me. I feel myself getting angry, realising now why Amicus had put this off for so long. I glare at him. Well, nothing too explicit, but there's caressing and... And a kiss at the end. Oh my god. I let my head drop, closing my eyes. Oh, I'm sorry, I just... I don't make up the dances or the rules, it's simply tradition. I let the silence drag out, letting Amicus squirm. But weird enough, I'm not as angry as I thought I'd be. Knowing Amicus for the two weeks I've been here, I guess I kind of just expected from him. Still, he's been nothing but respectful to me over the past few weeks, and if it means I can go home... Is that it? You caress me a little and... kiss me at the end? Well, for the most part, yes. And you're playing the role of a female, so you must dress a certain way. Are you kidding me? I feel my fl face flush red, something that Amicus has told me is kind of unnerving to see for someone covered in fur. Why do I have to do it then? Go get a female dancer or something. A professional will do this way better than me. Well, that's not the point of the trial. Me teaching you is part of it. And it's simply the role of the pet to do so. You should have told me this last week, Amicus. Amicus doesn't seem to have an answer for that besides a mumbled sorry. We stand there in an awkward silence for a little while longer before Amicus squares his shoulders. Listen, I will not force you to do anything you don't want to. That I promise. But... But doing this dance convincingly is needed for us to win. I sigh loudly. Who's even judging this? Okay, to and triumvirates from the five other major cities. Triumvirates? <clears throat> Wrong voice. Triumvirates. Oh, groups of three that govern the cities. So why do we even have to know music or dance to become an emperor anyway? Well, the more well-rounded the wolf, the better he is of the emperorship. An emperor that can fight just as well as he can dance shows good character. All right, fine. Just show me the dance. Amicus lets out one of those relieved sighs that he seems to have reserved just for me. Thank you. Again, I'm sorry. I was just so busy with official business and everything else. I didn't know how to approach you about this. Well, next time just tell me. I'm honestly more annoyed that you waited so long. Isn't the trial in a few days? Three days. Great. Well, it's a simple dance. You'll be able to learn it in a few hours, and we can practice tomorrow too. All right. I look around. So, do we have music or something? Uh, no. We don't need music. Do we? Well, I mean, I guess not. On Earth, we usually dance to music, without having to tell a story. Oh, really? So you just dance for no reason? Well, kind of. We usually dance to have fun. 
So why do you need music? I think. It's such a basic thing, but I've never had to explain it to anyone before, so I find myself trying to figure out the right way to go about it. Well, we need a beat or a rhythm to dance to. I mean, not always, but usually we move to an even spaced beat. Amicus absorbs that for a second and chuckles. <laughs> what? Oh, it's such a primate thing to do, to bang sticks and rocks together. Oh, you love your rhythms. It just sounds so, um, interesting. I frown, immediately picking up on the condescension. You mean primitive? Oh, no, just different. I sigh, letting it go for now. At least he's trying, I guess. Anyway, we're going to have an orator narrate the story for us. It's a combination of speaking and singing. I'll do that for now, though. Well, not the singing. I'll just speak. I stand there waiting and Amicus coughs awkwardly. Anyway. Amicus reaches out a paw and I take it after a short pause. Slowly he draws me closer to himself, the point that I can smell the lavender and floral mouthwash in his breath. I'm going to lead you through the movement, movements first while narrating. Then we'll start from the beginning again, all right? I nod in agreement. With that, Amicus starts to narrate the story. Ten thousand years ago, our empire was small, shriveled and parentless. We abandoned them and we were left to drift through the galaxy alone. Amicus turns, away from, turns me away from him to face the throne, his paw on my shoulder. Then Drusus, our dear emperor, came along and made a proposition. Amicus steps forward lightly on his toes, gesturing broadly with his paw. Let us reconnect with our parent and through them the rest of the universe. But it was not so easy. The siblings, long tired of wolven hubris, were reluctant to know them again. I stand there awkwardly, watching Amicus move around me in a sort of interpretive dance, mostly involving prancing and big gestures with his paws. That was until he met Mira, a Hindu sibling. Amicus turns to me then, stretching out a paw again, this time flat, like he's telling me to stop. All right, so just reach out the same way and press your paw to mine. I do as he asks, watching as his massive paw almost seems to envelop mine. He slowly pushes my hand upward, drawing me closer as he does. And before they could help it, they'd fallen in love. The story goes on for a while, Amicus teaching me the steps and hand movements as it does. The process is slow and tedious, but Amicus is patient with me and tells me that it's not the choreography that's necessarily important, but rather the feeling and passion we put into the movements. The story describes Mira and Drusus's relationship, evolving from one of official diplomatic business to true love. But it doesn't last long because Mira becomes sick from an unspecified illness and is about to die. The parents offer Drusus two options. Save Mira or save his empire and promise his people prosperity for the next 10,000 years. Drusus wants to choose Mira, even if it means damning his empire for millennia. At this point in the story, Amicus draws me into his chest, my back pe pressed to his friend as he holds me close, his voice rumbling in his chest. Then the story takes a sudden turn. Mira denies Drusus his own decision, instead taking her own life so his empire might survive. Here I'm supposed to put the back of my hand to my head, like I'm an old-timey woman in a corset passing out. Amicus carefully lowers me to the ground, laying me flat on my back. And so it was that another sibling saved our empire. Drusus was forced to his one remaining choice, which was no longer a choice. Amicus stands slowly, raising the paw to the sky, pointing. To the stars, he said. We are now a Dastra. Amicus holds a pose for a moment and looks down at me. Is that it? Yes. I sit up and Amicus reaches down to help me to my feet. Wasn't so bad, was it? Well, no, not really. As long as it doesn't matter if I don't do all the steps right. Oh no, you just need to have a general idea of it. Remember, it's the feeling you need to get right. The tragedy of it all. So is that story true? Seems like a weird choice to give some to give someone. And he made a really stupid decision. He basically killed Mira. Amica shrugs. Oh, it's mostly just a dramatic story. But Drusus was a real person. So was Mira. She did take her own life, but we don't really know why, or the extent of their relationship. Hmm. 
What about the kiss? You said the dance would involve that. Uh, thought we should leave that for the actual performance. I assume you don't want me kissing you over and over. Yeah, that's probably for the best. Anyway, let's do it a few more times and get you into the feel of it before we focus on the acting portion tomorrow. For the next few hours we go through the steps over and over. By the end we're both kind of sweaty being so close to each other while Vita shines in on us. Alright, why don't we take a break? Sure. Would you like to go to the communal bath? Where everyone takes a bath together? For the first time I can really smell the musk coming off of Amicus. It's not bad, but mixed with a laughing to smell, it's a little bit strange. Well, more to have a hot soak to ease the tension in the muscles. Oh, don't worry, you can keep your underwear on if you prefer. Oh, okay. Great. Amicus leads the way out of the throne room back into the marble halls. The cooler air hits my sweaty skin. I realise I probably don't smell so great either. The perfume the wolves use isn't all that strong. I adjust my robe, not liking the way the fabric sticks to my skin. Actually, all this dancing has me wishing I had jeans back. The dance positions have me feeling like it was hitching up and exposing my underwear. Can I wear pants when we do the dance? Pants? Why? I don't know, I guess it's just easier to move around in them. Oh, well, you'll be wearing a Hindu costume, which are also rather billowy. Sorry. Billowy. Why do you wear pants anyway? No one else does. Ah, oh, well, they've been coming into fashion over the last few years. Thought wearing a pair would endear the people to me. You want them to think you're hip? Well, I want them to believe I'm forward-thinking. Everyone else in the palace has this aura of traditionalism, which is not something I'm aiming for. Amicus adjusts his pants near the crotch. Well, I've grown to prefer them over the robe, but... In situations that involve a lot of sweating, it can grow a bit uncomfortable into the leather. Amicus stops by a door that I never noticed before, much smaller than the entrance to the throne room. He presses his paw to another black panel, the door sliding open. I'm immediately hit by a wall of humid warmth, steam wafting out through the open door. I follow the wolf inside, my skin immediately grown sticky and hot, making me wish that there was a swimming pool instead of what I assume was a giant hot tub. The wolf starts to strip off his clothing. Uh, I've been needing this all day. Also, excuse my nudity, but the water isn't kind of clothing. Otherwise, I keep the underwear on. I shrug. Well, it's not like I haven't seen it before. All right. The wolf lays his clothing down on one of the benches, his nude, sweaty form obscured slightly by the steam. He stretches, arching his back, his thick body thinning out a bit as he does. His dick also sticks out quite a bit, and even though I might have seen it before, the shameless display is a bit much. I have to look away while I slowly strip off my own robe. You're joining me, yes? Yeah. Good. I think you'll really enjoy this. It's very hot, but you get used to it. Amicus walks up to the edge of the pool. There are two methods, either getting slowly or all at once. And with that, the wolf jumps into the pool, practically cannonballing into the centre and sending up a huge wave that washes over the sides. The water that creeps up onto my feet is hot enough to make me flinch. Amicus comes back up, his fur plastered to his face as he gasps, and lets out a strange yell that makes it sound like he's in pain. Ah! Ow! 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 Are you alright? I walk up to the edge, feeling the hot water under my feet. Oh, fine, fine. I'm just getting used to it. And now I am. Amicus grins up at me. I stand there in my underwear, frowning down at the water. Come in, it feels good. That didn't look like it felt good. Oh, quit being such a flower and get in. It's only the first few seconds that are painful. Flower. The main insult used by the wolves when attacking someone's masculinity. Well, I guess you do have a really low pain tolerance, so... I start to dip a toe in. Hey! Amicus glares up at me, then grins. I know that look well by now. Hey, don't! The wolf glides up to the edge of the pool with only half his muzzle sticking up from the water, like an ominous furry shark fin. I start to move back. That's when Amicus suddenly rises out of the water, stepping onto an underwater bench along the edge of the pool that I hadn't seen. He wraps his arms around me, his hot fur-plastered body squeezing against me for a moment, then squeezing even harder as he physically lifts me off the ground and falls back into the pool. 
only have a moment to try and fight the wolf off, uselessly pushing at his bulk before I'm plunged into the steaming hot water. For a moment I wonder if I'm going to boil alive, but as soon as Amicus lets me go and my head breaks through the surface, I can already feel the sting wearing off into pleasant warmth. I cough a few times, making a face at the salty tasting water, spitting it out. <laughs> See? Oh, not so bad if you do it all at once. I spit out more water. Ah, uh, bad taste? Oh, don't worry, it's just the minerals in the water. I shove a wave of water into Amicus's face, sending it right into his open mouth. He coughs and spits, choking on the water I just forcibly slammed down his throat. Blah! You ass! The wolf pours the water out of his eyes, looking ready to try and splash me as well. He sees me also at the ready, though, hands up to my chest and ready to send another wave into his face. Well, that's enough roughhousing, I guess. Stuff like that is best left for the lake. Hey, you started it. Amicus ignores me, instead moving to sit on the underwater bench. I do the same, sitting a foot away from the wolf, developing my face in the steam that rises off the water. Doesn't this feel good? Now that I'm actually paying attention to the sensation of the water, I have to agree. The heat seems to seep through my skin and into the muscle, sending a pleasant shiver up my spine even though I'm completely warm. Yeah. Well, I need to do this more often. All of this official business nonsense is starting to weigh on my mental capacities. Is it really nonsense? Well, for the most part it really is. So much useless etiquette and protocol. Sometimes I completely understand what it is Cassius dislikes about the current way of things. What way of things? Oh, just the way politics work. Never saying what we're actually thinking, using coded language. It slows things down. I know there's a reason for it. It keeps things civil and peaceful. Mostly. And Cassius would do away with that. He would do away with many things, current political protocol being one of them. It's one of the main reasons he's so popular. Well, you seem to kind of agree with it. Getting things done without all that official business nonsense in the way could be a good thing. Hmm. Amica sinks lower into the water until it's up to his neck. Remember the story I just told you about Drusus and Mira? Yeah. Well, whether that story is true or not, he was the one that started the way we do things to this day. Before him, well, we had a string of populist emperors and the results were not great from what I've read. Honestly, I completely understand what it is that makes Cassius appealing to the people. And it's something I sometimes want to do myself. The only thing holding me back is history. Time and time again, whenever a leader like Cassius has come around, it only results in a weak, isolated empire. Well, from what little I've heard, isn't that how it is now? Well, yes. Well, that's because we've never fully transitioned to an outward-looking and outreaching empire. Drusa started it, but it's taken us 10,000 years to get here. It was much worse back then, and that's what Cassius wants to go back to. I intend to take some of the final steps so we may join the other siblings on the journey to parenthood. Oh, so that's the goal for everyone, to become a parent. Oh yes, and to continue the spread of our culture beyond the galaxy. So what makes you a parent? Well, we can travel the other galaxies in a practical manner. Oh, so why not just use the stretch drive for that? Well, it is not possible to harness enough power to use the stretch drive for such distances. The parents have a different method, but they haven't told us how, obviously. Hmm. So you're close to doing it? To intergalactic travel? No. Is anyone? Well, there are rumours that the Chemians are on the verge of it. It wouldn't surprise me. It's assumed they already know how to use their own stretch drive. This talk about the stretch drive reminds me of something. So, when I was out serving Cassius... Amicus growls softly in his throat as I remind him. Well, they were talking about stuff, about the stretch drive depletion or whatever. Oh? Yeah, so apparently no one knows why your parents stopped talking to you guys? And Virginia was saying that you might never leave the star system again? Oh. I frowned at him. Well, that was rather presumptuous of her. Is it true? Well, no. I mean, sure, it doesn't happen often, but they stopped immediately after father's death. There's no other explanation that our parent knew that we, there would be issues with the Emperorship. The stretch and contact with our parent will be re-established once I become Emperor. 
I promise you that, Thibault. Amicus says it with his usual confidence, but that's unsettled the anxiety in my stomach. I sigh in frustration, closing my eyes. Why is everything so complicated with you? What do you mean? If you just tell me the actual truth about everything that's going on, I wouldn't feel like I'm being hit over the head with something new every day. Tibor, stop worrying. Well, I know things seem unsure, but it's only because of the precarious position our empire is in right now. Once I become emperor, things will settle, and we will figure out how to get you home. Amicus sets a paw on my shoulder. I turn to look at him, my expression probably still gloomy. I will get you home, Tibor. That I promise. And even if the stretch isn't immediately restored, I will find a way. Even it means making some sort of deal with another sibling, like the Chemians. Amicus frowns at his last statement. Still, that does set me at ease, and I place a hand on his paw. Thanks, Amicus. Amicus' his very serious mood dissipates, and his ears come up as he smiles. So you're feeling relaxed again? That is why we're here, you know. I smile. Yeah, I guess so. Good. We fall into a bit of a silence then, I lean my head back against the ledge of the pool, letting the warmth take over my body. It makes me feel heavy and tired, but good. My head slips off the ledge a few times as I doze off a bit, each time waking up before my head can go into the water. Amicus notices the third time this happens. Sleepy? A little. Or lean against me so you don't make the bottom of the pool your new bed. I hesitate. Oh, don't worry. We already share the same bed. Amicus stretches an arm out over the ledge behind my head, not even looking at me as he does. I get the weird feeling that I'm in a movie theatre, and my date just tried to casually rest his arm on the back of my chair. But my head feels even heavier than the rest of my body, so I give in, letting it rest against Amicus's massive bicep and shoulder. I close my eyes, but then crack them open just a bit to look at Amicus. He seems to be trying to stifle a smile. We've had a few moments like these. At this point I'm not sure if it's because he likes me or because he sees me as some sort of actual pet, like a cat curling up in your lap. I don't have much time to give it much thought because I start to fall asleep again. I'm not sure how long I'm asleep, seconds or minutes, but that's when I hear the door open. It's not a loud sound, but Amicus jumps, which makes me jump. We both look toward the door. Neferu stands there, his eyes on us, that same smile on his face. Oh, imagine running into you again today! Again, Neferu talks directly to me. Without waiting for an answer, he strides in, paws busily tugging at his loincloth. I'm sorry, I've come to the baths every day for the past week, but I've never encountered anyone. He strips off his loincloth, now only in his undergarments. I was beginning to think it was never put to use. He starts to unwrap said undergarments. I found it strange, considering how incredibly relaxing the water is, or it's such a great way to clear the mind and meditate. He unwraps his underwear, the cloth tied in a way that looked much more complicated than my own. Not that I mind, I always enjoy good company and conversation. I have just enough time to notice the anatomical differences between Amicus and Neferu, for I look away, feeling awkward staring at someone I barely knew in the nude. I'm not sure who he's talking to either, whether he's moved on from me to Amicus, or if he's still exclusively zeroed in on me. Either way, Amicus answers while I stare at the steamy water. Um, I see. Well, I also enjoyed the baths. Well, it's just that we tend to be so busy these days. Oh, I imagine. Neferu's voice gets closer behind me as he speaks, his soft footsteps barely audible. Being adrift without an emperor can really hamper an empire. At this point, it sounds like Nefru is standing just over me, and I can only imagine what else is just over me. Amicus is craning his neck, looking up at the jackal. Well, we do have an emperor, just not the official one, yet. Indeed. I hear a soft splash next to me, and out of the corner of my eye, I see one of the jackal's legs dip into the water to stand on the bench, followed by the other. Ah, that's nice. I took a rather long walk in the gardens today, as if my paws rather sore. This is a welcome reprieve. Mm-hmm. Amicus grunts next to me, then actually pulls me in a bit with his arm. Nefru then gently hops off the bench to submerge himself up to his neck. He lets out a soft, drawn-out sigh, his eyes closed before he pulls himself up onto the bench, right next to me. 
Amicus lets out a sigh of his own, though this one is much shorter and very annoyed sounding. Oh, we don't have baths like this in our palace. I think I might request one though, once I return home. Hmm. Again, Amicus barely responds, letting out a half-hearted grunt. At this point, the wolf has his arm completely around me, practically pulling me into his chest. It's awkward and we sit like that for a while, maybe about five minutes before Nefru finally speaks again. So, how long have you been here, Tibor? I give a start, then look up at Amicus. One of his eyes twitches, but he gives me a short nod. Uh, too weak. Again, I hold my breath, stop myself from laughing at my caveman speak. For some reason, it's cr- incredibly hilarious, even when the situation is totally serious. Mm, so you need permission to speak to me? I did not know that you were so strict with your slaves, Amicus. Amicus coughs in surprise. He's my pet, well, not a slave. Oh, maybe it's a lingua issue, but from what I've seen, there's very little difference. You do enslave your children, after all, no? Amicus is quiet for a moment. I look back, back up at him, see him staring at the jackal, his mouth open. Are you all right? Well, excuse me, but I'm finding your questions a bit pointed. Oh, I'm sorry. I've been told our way of speaking can be a bit blunt by your standards, but consider that the topic of slavery is always pointed. Well, why don't we move to a less pointed topic, then? Of course. So, Tibor, what is your species? I must say I've never seen your kind before. And because his arm tightens around my shoulder again, but he doesn't say anything, staring straight ahead at the other side of the pool. Uh, Simeon. Nefru chuckles next to me. You know, he don't have to speak in such a simple way to me. I already know that you can verse well enough. I stiffen up, but Amicus jumps in for me. What are you talking about, Jackal? Oh, are we already jumping to informal language? Well, I'm simply referring to his intelligence, Wolf. I'm confused as to why he's downplaying it for me. Well, I don't know how you know anything about him. Come, Tibor, let's head back to my room. Amicus stands and pulls me up. But Nefru stands with us, reaching out for one of the white towels. That is why I'm trying to make conversation with him. But if he needs your permission to do anything, including speak, then maybe I should leave your slave alone? Amicus turns on the Kemian, not bothering to hide his anger anymore. He is not a slave. Please refrain from calling him as such. If he isn't, then he should be able to speak freely. He is able to speak freely, Jackal. And I have to wonder why he asked your permission and stupefies his speech. It's all a bit odd, isn't it? Again, I don't know how you know anything about him. Alex told me. The jackal grins. I know he's using Alex's shortened name. Amica stares in surprise. So don't worry, T-Boy. You can speak without worrying about what I might learn. Nefru sets a paw on my shoulder. Amicus's his hackles raise. Gently but firmly, he reaches out to move Nefru's paw off my shoulder. Please do not touch my pet. Oh, so he needs permission to be touched as well? Amicus steps sideways, partially blocking me from the jackal's view. What is your concern with him, Neferu? I'm simply interested in intelligent species I've never seen before, and well... Neferu reaches out between Amicus's shoulder, touching my hair and rubbing it between two finger pads, similar to what Amicus sometimes does. He is a fascinating look- mm. I start to move my head away, but before I know it, Amicus has Nefru shoved up against the wall, one paw on his chest glaring into his face. I said not to touch him. His voice is low, almost too quiet for me to hear. I want to jump in somehow, maybe push Amicus towards the door so we can just leave and not cause an interstellar incident. But they're both so big and intimidating. Oh right, sorry. I keep forgetting he's not a slave with the way you treat him, needing your permission for everything. He doesn't. I step forward then. Well, you need my permission. The statement just sort of slips out of my mouth, my irritation with the jackal growing along with Amicus's. Nefru's eyes widen for just a moment for his smile returns. Ah, so it is true. I knew I saw intelligence in those eyes. Despite having a canine that's a good deal larger than him pinning him to the wall, Nefru seems quite calm. You know nothing of the way I treat him. And please do not call him a slave again. It is an affront to his actual status. Again, my apologies. He looks at me. May I touch you in a friendly manner in the future? A paw on the shoulder, an embrace even? Chemians are always physically intimate. 
I stare at him. No. Amicus snorts with satisfaction, blowing back some fur on Nefru's face. Now, kind of leave my pet alone in the future. It's very busy. Again, this language that implies you own him. It's confusing to me. Amicus growls, but Nefru doesn't seem to notice the warning. I suppose it's only natural for a slave-driving race such as your own. You believe you own everything and everyone lower on the hierarchy. Amicus's eyes widen, nostrils flaring. What? I'll have you know that they are servants, and I do plan to change. Never mind, it is not your place to criticise my empire. Nefru seems to take some interest in what Amicus just said, pausing for only a moment before speaking again. Your empire? Didn't you say someone else was acting as the emperor? The empire belongs to all wolves. Well, have you know that I will become the emperor, Jackal. And keeping that in mind, you should learn to hold your tongue if you want to establish an alliance. Ah, but does the empire belong to the servants that mine your natural resources across the dozens of planets in our galaxy? What is your issue with me? Or are you this rude to everyone you meet? The jackal is quiet, and Amicus just growls at him, waiting for an answer. That's when I realise that Nefru isn't even looking at Amicus's face. He's looking at... And uh, now that I'm looking at it, I realise it's looking a bit bigger than usual. You know, I heard rumours that the Emperor's son was a tail raiser, but honestly, I wasn't expecting you to use this moment as an opportunity. You simply want to get your paws on me. In one smooth, fluid motion, Nefru spins into Amicus, thumping his back into the other canine's front, making the big wolf grunt and puff out into the top of Nefru's head with an oof sound. Nefru leans there against the wolf, holding onto his big paw, the other comes up to tease at Amicus's chin. Amicus looks surprised, but he doesn't do anything to push the jackal away. Meanwhile, the jackal's rear pushes firmly up against Amicus's crotch. Amicus seems frozen, staring down at the jackal. What little I learned about Adastrian slang on the TV, Nefru would just imply that Amicus is gay. If you're interested, you only had to ask. I know the woven ways of flirting are rather aggressive, and even though we jackals do things differently, I can adjust. At that, Amicus glares and roughly pushes Nefru away, sending the jackals stumble against the wall. He turns around swiftly as Grinstim's place. Oh, did I get the wrong idea? I just assumed after you groped my chest and became excited. Nefro gestures down in Amicus's crotch. The wolf's erect cock still waving around a bit after the jackal had spun away. Immediately Amicus covers himself with both paws, glaring. I did not. And you're the one to touch my pet without his permission. Amicus looks around for his underwear, snatching it up and beginning to tie it on. I quickly grab a towel on my robes, feeling completely confused as to what the hell just happened. Again, I thought he was your slave. But you're right. I should have asked for his permission. His fur was simply mesmerising, so I forgot myself for a moment. Nefru turns to me and bows. Good day, Tibor. I wish you luck in relieving your master's carnal desires. Nefru gestures at the fumbling wolf as he tries to tie on his underwear correctly. And to you, Amicus. Again, if you're interested, you only need to let me know. Are you joking with me? Nefru's already striding off, grabbing up his own underwear and loincloth as he does, not even finished tying it on by the time he's walking out the door. We both stand there in silence for a bit, staring as the door slides shut. Then Amicus grabs up the rest of his clothes with a growl, turning to me. You alright? Uh, yeah, of course. What? Come on. And then Amicus is walking off even faster than Nefru had. I quickly follow, not bothering to put on my robe since I'm still pretty wet. We walk down the hall, Amicus muttering under his breath the whole time. Unbelievable, unbelievable! How do you have the nerve, more arrogant Chemian ass? As we make our way towards Amicus's room, I go over what just happened in my head. It seemed Nefru was making some kind of point about slavery, while at the same time taking that strange interest in me. On top of that, the obvious sexual tension between the two of them was really odd, especially the way Amicus just stood there and let Nefru rub up against him while it's clearly hard. Is this just how these aliens hit on each other, with all that bizarre macho aggression? If it is, then I don't like it, but that doesn't matter. I'm not sure for that kind of stuff anyway. I just need to get home. But at the same time, 
There's a little spark of jealousy in my chest, the thought of Amicus being interested in Neferu. I don't know why, but the way he treated me at the pool almost seemed like flirting itself. And then to immediately have eyes for Neferu. As we walk into Amicus's room, I can't help myself. So is that the woven way of flirting? I ask it casually, trying to act like I don't mind. What? Definitely not. Well, that damn jackal was assuming quite a lot. I mean, I feel myself flush. You were getting kind of hard while you had him pinned against the wall. Right. I mean, I'm not offended or anything. I'm just curious about the culture, if that's how you guys go about things here. Amica sighs heavily. Uh, well, I suppose wolves have a reputation for being aggressive when it comes to courting a mate, but those days are long gone. The jackal was simply relying on dated stereotypes. Okay. I adjust my robe a bit, the cold air of the room seeping through my still wet underwear. Not to pry too much, but are you gay? Neferu seemed to imply that. Amicus freezes, staring at me. He doesn't seem to know what to tell me, like he's afraid of what my reaction might be. I remember then how stigmatised homosexuality is here. Homophobic slurs are used a lot in the films I've seen, including Tail Razor and Cock Licker. It's weird because males seem to be pretty intimate with each other, kissing and holding paws being common between close friends. However, there are lines that aren't crossed, and actually being gay was looked down upon, which is what Nefru accused Amicus of being. I quickly try to reassure him. You know, it's a fairly accepted thing on Earth these days, and I have no issue with it. If you are, you can tell me. Amicus goes on staring at me for a little while longer than sighs. I have a preference for males, yes. He wins his right after saying that. Hey, it's fine. Like I said, it's pretty well accepted in a lot of places on Earth. But it explains why you were getting hard in front of Neferu. I... Listen, it wasn't what I was intending when I first grabbed him. I was trying to defend you. Ah, I see. Amicus, is, Amicus blushes all over again. The wolf turns away and walks over the sofa before slumping into it, leaning his face into a paw, looking frustrated. What's wrong? Well, that jackal for one, and... I don't know. Are you disgusted with me now? Why would I be disgusted with you? Well, I don't know. You must see past incidences in a different light, like the massages and wrestling, and the dance. I promise those are p truly pet duties, and I was only having a bit of fun at the amphitheatre, and I only did what the dance called for. I shake my head. I think you've been really good about not taking advantage of me at all. It's fine. Amicus looks at me, and sure. And you never have to do those things again if you don't want. I'll understand. I raise a hand up. Seriously, you're fine. Amicus looks away, looking relieved but still ashamed. Oh, I'm sorry, it's... It's just something that's followed me most of my life. I had an incident happen several years back, and it's created a lot of rumours about me. The people aren't very interested in having a tail razor as their emperor. Amicus finally looks at me. So I try to keep it quiet so it might be forgotten. Sort of what mostly was until the Chemian mentioned it. Amicus growls. <sighs> anyway, I'm sorry. I suppose it was something I should have told you, considering how close quarters we've been living. The wolf looks so dejected, so sad, and he sighed I should tell him. You know, I'm gay too. Amicus snapped his gaze back to me, eyes wide. What? I feel my face turning red. I'm the same. I like guys. Amicus squints at me, like he can't quite believe what I just said. Are you making fun of me? What? No! I'm telling you so you don't feel so bad about it. It's fine. Oh. Well, that's quite the coincidence. Yeah, it is. Well, uh, oh, thank you for telling me. That is, isn't easy to do. At least it isn't for me. I'm the same. I slowly walk over and sit on the sofa next to the wolf, feeling strangely awkward about our little coming-out conversation. Amicus still looks a bit uncomfortable, but at least he doesn't look sad anymore. So, since we're talking about all of this, what was Nefru saying about me helping you out with your dick? Is that a pet duty too? 
Well, yes, yes it is. But again, I would never ask that of you. Does Annex do that? Amicus pulls a face. Well, I'd rather not think of my brother in such a situation. Yes, he does. But does that mean your brother's gay too? No, well, not as far as I know. He doesn't have a preference for males. Isn't that what makes you a homosexual? I shrug. So I just give you a hand job or something? I can tell the lingua had no trouble translating that to Amicus, because he immediately blushes again. I squirm, wondering what I'm, why I'm asking so much about this topic. I'm curious, I already know that I'm attracted to this wolf. I'd given up on denying it a while ago. It can involve a lot of things. I mean, if you want to do it, I have no objections. But it's your choice. Amicus sounds tentatively hopeful, and I realise that he actually wants it. Seems that every day I go further and further with this wolf. I laugh, partly at Amicus's expression, and partly because of the absurdity of this entire situation. How about if we win the dance trial? I'll think about it. I'm speaking without thinking. Amicus is quiet, then nods. Oh, sounds fair. I try to think of something else to talk about, still shocked at what I just proposed. So what's the deal with Neferu? Why did he do all that stuff in the bath? I honestly have no idea. It was very strange. Hmm. I think that's his way further than an alliance. Well, not if he has any common sense. I thought he's going to be friendly, considering he knows I'm open to the alliance, unlike Cassius. I lean back on the sofa, thinking, hmm, maybe he was just feeding you out. Amicus smirks at that. Well, you could say that. Anyway, I don't know how to feel about him. I'm thinking of just telling him that I'm not interested in the alliance unless they send someone that has more tact. Amicus glances at me. What do you think? Well, I think if he's the only guy you have to establish the alliance with, you should try to work with him. I mean, this could be your best chance if you're willing to put up with him. Hmm. And he seems to have the hots for you, so that'll probably help you, honestly. <laughs> maybe. But I don't know, I'm not a politician. But you are smart. Thanks. Anyway, I'm off to my shower. The wolf stands up and I do the same. Do you need help? Oh, really? Yeah. I want to show him that things haven't changed. I'm not scared of him now that I know his secret. He looked so devastated when he told me. Neither if Amicus was the one to get me into this mess. I know now that he's a good person. Doesn't deserve to feel like that. I mean, I've seen your junk already, so no surprises there, right? <laughs> I suppose not. If you're sure. I'm sure. To decide things for the wolf, I walk into the shower. Amicus isn't far behind. <laughs>